Great. Thank you so much, Paige. Uh, so this is Susan Annenberg from George Washington University. Thank you so much for joining us. The topic of today's webinar is the use of uh, satellite remote sensing to estimate the uh, NO2 impacts, uh, the impacts of nitrogen dioxide pollution on, uh, on human health from local to global scales. And as we begin, I want to acknowledge that uh, we have received support for this work from the NASA Health and Air Quality Applied Science Team and additional support from the Health Effects Institute. And the work that we're presenting today is uh, the conglomeration of uh, work from uh, many others, many of our colleagues and collaborators in addition to us three. And we uh, really appreciate the, um, all the great work that goes into uh, developing the, uh, the estimates and the methods that we're going to present today. I guess you want to go to my slide. Um, so uh, Paige already introduced us, but just so you can uh, see who we are, this is, again, Susan Annenberg. Um, I'll be presenting today with Dr. Michael Brower, who's a professor at the University of British Columbia and is serving as the team lead for the Environmental Risk Factor Group uh, for the uh, Global Burden of Disease Study, which is led by the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation at the University of Washington. And as well as Dr. Dan Goldberg, who's sitting uh, here to my right, who is a research scientist at George Washington University and Argonne National Laboratory. In terms of the agenda today, we'll start with an overview of the global burden of disease and air pollution and how nitrogen dioxide relates to the, uh, the current estimates of the uh, global burden of disease from air pollution. Um, and that will be led by Dr. Brower. I will then talk about a, uh, a two initial case studies that we did to estimate the uh, disease burden from NO2 from local to global scales and talk about how we pull information together from satellite remote sensing, uh, from epidemiology, and from, um, and from uh, chemical transport modeling to understand the, the health impacts of nitrogen dioxide pollution. And then Dr. Goldberg uh, will talk about the use of satellite remote sensing uh, specifically for nitrogen dioxide, uh, to estimate nitrogen dioxide levels um, around the world using uh, satellite sensors OMI and TROPOMI, and we will then take questions all at the end. So I anticipate us speaking for about 30 to 40 minutes, and then we'll have 20 to 30 minutes of questions at the end. So I will now hand it over to Dr. Brower. All right, next slide, Dan. Thanks, Susan. So just by way of uh, getting started, I think it's well known to most people in the audience that air pollution is uh, now acknowledged as a major risk factor for global health. Um, it's estimated to contribute to up to around 9% of all deaths in the world with uh, costs exceeding $5 trillion per year. The attributable deaths from particulate matter alone are estimated to account for somewhere around 3 million deaths every year with another half million or so deaths um, from ozone. And these deaths are uh, unequally distributed around the world, so especially impacting uh, rapidly developing economies, uh, especially in, in Asia, India, and China in particular, but also elsewhere in Asia, as well as the Middle East. Next slide, please. But that's really not all uh, that air pollution that contributes uh, to health. So these uh, current air pollution risks are limited to particulate matter and ozone. And we know that these don't really fully char characterize urban air pollution, especially the, the air pollution that's mostly related to motor vehicle exhaust which is really a prime source of air pollution in cities around the world, and especially in cities uh, in high-income countries. In addition, uh, the diseases that are estimated to, um, to be linked to air pollution in the global burden of disease currently are uh, things like lung cancer, cardiovascular disease, uh, lower respiratory illness, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, but not asthma. And asthma, if you ask probably most people uh, on the street, they would actually assume that asthma is probably the prime uh, impact of, of air pollution. So this sort of link between air pollution and asthma, as well as this form of city-level air pollution, is currently not accounted 
in these burden of disease assessments. So next slide, please. So traffic-related air pollution, uh, which is the, the air pollution uh, directly emitted from motor vehicles as well as that caused by brake and tire wear, we know has very sharp gradients uh, within cities. Uh, levels can drop off by a half or a third within uh, several hundred meters uh, from a, ma a major road. And this has been characterized in, in detail in, in many cities around the world through techniques such as land use regression modeling, or mobile monitoring or various types of saturation um, monitoring. And we see these, these very, very fine scale gradients that, uh, that really capture this motor vehicle contribution to air quality and provide levels of variation uh, of factors of three or more in the levels of exposure uh, across major urban areas. Next, please. And using th that kind of information, there have now been multiple studies conducted in, in many places around the world and have been summarized in meta-analyses that show associations between this traffic-related air pollution, especially as characterized by high-resolution re measurements uh, or estimates of nitrogen dioxide, and linked to pediatric asthma, so asthma development in young children. So this would be new cases of asthma, so air pollution not as a trigger for asthma, but air pollution actually is causing new cases of asthma. Next, please. So this is just one example of a meta-analysis published in 2017 by Hanin Kreis. Um, and you can see that there's, uh, on average, a, an increased risk of asthma. And most of the studies show an increased risk of, of asthma associated with exposure to, to nitrogen dioxide uh, air pollution. Next slide, please. Um, there's also strong biological plausibility. Next, please. Um, showing the, the pathway. So uh, the, this, this pollution actually can lead to uh, airway hyper-responsiveness, which can uh, both trigger asthma, but also can lead to development of, of asthma. Next slide, please. And both the US EPA and Health Canada, who have, who have assessed uh, the evidence recently, both the epidemiologic evidence and the toxicologic evidence, uh, indicate that nitrogen dioxide exposure on a long-term basis is likely a, a causal uh, factor for the development of pediatric asthma. Next slide, please. And now in order to um, characterize nitrogen dioxide at this very, very fine spatial scale uh, everywhere and around the world, which is what would be required uh, in a global disease burden assessment, uh, requires high resolution estimates of nitrogen dioxide everywhere around the world. And until recently, that was not uh, possible. Uh, there's very, very sparse nitrogen dioxide monitoring around the world. Um, but through the combination of satellite-based uh, estimates as well as land use information and available measure, measurements. Uh, an analysis led by, by Andrew Larkin and Perry Heistad at Oregon State University, which was published in 2017, provided the first um, global high resolution surface <clears throat> of nitrogen dioxide concentrations uh, around the world. And this now made it feasible <clears throat> to think about conducting a global burden of disease assessment uh, linked to nitrogen dioxide at, at the spatial scale. Great. Uh, so as uh, Michael just described, you know, we, the, he sort of explained the groundwork for what we know about the health effects of NO2, how NO2 is linked uh, with pediatric asthma incidents. So there's, again, new cases of asthma that would not have developed uh, were it not for the exposure to traffic-related air pollution. Um, we have... Uh, we have put together new methods for estimating the global burden of nitrogen dioxide pollution on pediatric asthma incidents through two papers. Um, one was published in 2018, that was the one on the left here, um, in Environmental Health Perspectives, and here is where we uh, developed methods for the first time to estimate the global burden of air pollution on asthma incidents and emergency room visits. And here we looked at PM2.5, ozone, and NO2. And what we found through this, uh, through this exercise was that the, a couple things. One is that the strongest evidence for um, new cases of asthma uh, was for NO2. Uh, 
Um, so the, the, there was very strong evidence linking NO2 pollution with new uh, pediatric asthma cases. And that the, uh, we also found that the methods that we were using uh, were pro likely underestimating the global burden of NO2 on pediatric asthma incidents. Um, and that was because we used surface NO2 from the ozone monitoring instrument on board the Aura satellite. Um, but that had relatively uh, coarse resolution, uh, 0.1 by 0.1 degree resolution, which, which is about 10 kilometers on a side. Um, and the, uh, the mid-afternoon or early afternoon flyover time of the satellite um, was sort of at the low point of NO2 throughout the day, and this needed to be converted to a 24-hour average uh, to um, be consistent with the epidemiological studies, which use either 24-hour average NO2 or annual average NO2. So we linked, uh, we integrated um, OMI observations with the GMI replay chemical transport model to convert the column observations from the um, OMI sensor to surface concentrations and the 1.45 p.m. observations to 24-hour averages. And uh, that 10-kilometer uh, resolution is likely too coarse to capture these high near roadway concentrations that Michael was just talking about. So we wanted to follow up with a more refined analysis using this land use regression model that Michael just uh, showed. And this model had 100 meter resolution, so quite a bit uh, more refined. It did use satellite remote sensing as part of the land use regression. Um, the satellite retrievals were from GOM2 and uh, Skiamaki. Um, and this was, uh, you know, this is the data set that was uh, available at the time. We're now working on refining this further with support from HACAST and the Health Effects Institute. And the, the product of the application of that, uh, of that land use regression model for estimating the global burden of NO2 on pediatric asthma incidents was published in Lancet Planetary Health in 2019 um, by my, po my postdoc, Ploya Chikolosit, and, and our colleagues. Um, that's the paper that you see here on the right. I'm just going to show some uh, sample results from that paper just to sort of give a sense for the magnitude of the findings uh, that we, um, you know, that, that we reported in that paper and uh, some indication of where uh, we might go with this next. So first, how we estimate the global burden of disease from air pollution. And this, this is a method that is uh, often called the attributable fraction method. Um, it's used in other areas beyond air pollution, and it can be applied at any spatial scale. So you can do this at the local scale, the national scale, the global scale. Um, whatever scale you're interested in. Uh, what you need is uh, to first estimate the population attributable fraction, that is the fraction of uh, some disease in a population that is attributable to the risk factor. In this case, the risk factor is traffic-related NO2 pollution. Um, to estimate that population attributable fraction, you need some estimate of the exposure level. And of course, this is where satellite remote sensing comes in because, as Michael mentioned, the monitors, the ground monitors for NO2 are sparsely located throughout the world. Uh, so we need some way to fill in the gaps uh, spatially between where the monitors exist. So uh, we need some, some estimate of exposure levels everywhere in the world to do this on a, uh, on a global scale. We need the effect size, that's the concentration response relationship from the epidemiological studies. And we need some knowledge of some optimal level that is uh, not a level at which NO2 is actually good for you, but a, a level at which um, we can actually feasibly reduce NO2 pollution given the natural sources of NO2 as well. And we put that population attributable fraction together with a disease-specific burden, that is the uh, number of cases of uh, disease in a population, um, not just from not just attributable to air pollution, but from all uh, from all uh, you know risk factors. And we put those together, and we can calculate the attributable disease burden. So uh, Michael showed the global picture of NO2 concentrations from the land use regression model that, that we're using. And here we've just zoomed in on a few cities just to show, um, again, how urban a problem NO2 is. It's, very, it's a very urban uh, uh, problem. Concentrations are much higher in urban areas and uh, particularly near roadways. So. Um, we need some way to go beyond the spatial, res the current spatial resolution of the uh, satellite sensors and get to a finer resolution to be able to capture um, population exposure, particularly near roadways. And that's where this land use regression model um, comes in. Um, 
So just some uh, high-level results from this analysis, we found that every year about 4 million children developed asthma due to NO2 pollution, and that accounted for about 13% of the global annual burden. The top national burdens in terms of attributable cases per year were in China, India, the U.S., and Indonesia. Uh, but you can see they're relatively distributed uh, throughout the world. Um, one major finding that uh, we reported was that about 92% of NO2 attributable pediatric asthma incidents occurred in areas where NO2 concentrations were already below the current World, he World Health Organization guideline of 21 parts per billion for annual average NO2. And so this indicates that the WHO guideline may need to be revisited to ensure that it is adequately, uh, adequately safe for, for children. Interestingly, the spatial pattern of NO2 attributable asthma impacts differs from PM2.5 related mortality. So for those of you who are accustomed to looking at maps of PM2.5 related uh, mortality, which is already, as Michael mentioned, currently in the uh, Global Burden of Disease Study, one of the top uh, global health risk factors. Um, for PM2.5 related mortality, we see the highest, uh, the highest impacts in, um, in developing countries and places where we know that the PM2.5 levels are, uh, are much higher than the rest of the world. Here for NO2, we see that there's a very high percent of new asthma cases attributable to NO2 exposure all over the world, including both developing countries and developed countries, um, the, even including the U.S. and Canada and uh, throughout Europe. Um, so this is a much more spatially homogenous picture uh, than for PM2.5 related mortality. And uh, we see this at the urban scale as well, that NO2 attributable uh, asthma uh, impacts are high in both developed and developing cities. Um, the vast majority of the NO2 attributable pediatric asthma impacts um, occurred in urban centers, and that, that includes uh, suburban areas, but globally about 90% of NO2 attributable pediatric asthma incidents occurred in urban centers. So we just took a look at 125 uh, major cities just to see what the, uh, the level of impacts were in those cities. And we found that the percent of new pediatric asthma cases that were attrib attributable to NO2 ranged from 6% all the way up to 48%, and that was in Shanghai. Um, so what that indicates is that in Shanghai, uh, about half of new pediatric asthma cases are attributable to NO2 pollution. And as you can see, the, uh, the bar for Shanghai is not isolated. Um, there are elevated levels in all of these 125 cities. In fact, the percent of new pediatric asthma cases that were attributable to NO2 exceeded 20% in 92 cities. And again, that was located in both, those were located in both developed and developing countries. So how does satellite remote sensing, um, excuse me, how does satellite remote sensing uh, factor into this? I mentioned how it was used in the data sets that we use as inputs to, this, to these uh, global burden of disease analyses. Um, there's also a need to improve upon the NO2 concentration um, inputs that, that we've used. Um, satellites can help us improve those estimates um, because we need uh, to be consistent with the global burden of disease comparative framework. So in order to do that, we can't limit our analysis only to the areas of the world where there are NO2 monitors. We have to be able to fill in the gaps uh, to get full global coverage and be able to estimate the disease burden everywhere around the world. Uh, satellite remote sensing can also help us develop temporal trends. So for example, the global burden of disease study estimates the burden of disease from 1990 to 2019, to the present day, and uh, we need the satellite remote sensing to develop these temporal trends um, for at least, you know, for much of that period uh, from the start of the satellite era, um, because in many locations there were no NO2 monitors going back uh, that far. Um, for uh, NO2, we, it's also very important that we have high spatial resolution for reasons that we've already mentioned, including the, um, the high near roadway concentrations and the urbanicity of the problem. So we need the uh, satellite remote sensing can help us tease out the impacts in urban areas versus in rural areas and to be able to get to population exposure at very fine resolutions, particularly near roadway concentrations. So I'm now going to hand it over to Dan, who will walk us through more detail about how to use remote sensing for estimating NO2 concentrations. 
Thank you, Susan. So as alluded to by both Susan and Michael, um, the number of surface monitors are fairly are quite sparse. This is actually from a paper by Randall Martin published last year. This is looking at PM 2.5, but NO2 numbers are probably similar, if not worse. Um, and the number of PM 2.5 monitors per million people are on the order of one for many countries, and it can be even less than that for several, and certainly um, zero in, in, in many others. So um, this really shows why and how satellite data can be used to really fill in the gaps for these countries. Um, obviously, the ones with no monitors, they can be very helpful, but even the ones that do have monitors, such as the U.S. and Canada, which have fairly high values compared to the rest of the world, um, we still, you know, there's still many kilometers, hundreds of kilometers, often even in the United States, where there, there's no data. So satellite data can be very helpful in, in, in this instance. So um, I'll just uh, gloss over or just describe this qu quickly. What does, uh, what is NO2 from satellite? Um, how is it measured? Um, if you haven't been on other calls, HACAP calls, um, I'll just uh, discuss this briefly. There's two satellites that were instruments that we're looking at here. Um, OMI, the ozone monitoring instrument, has pixels approximately 13 by 24 square kilometers, and then TROPE OMI, which was launched um, two and a half years ago now, and uh, the pic pixels are much, much smaller. But the record, the long-term record, isn't quite as long. Um, OMI was launched in 2004 versus TROPE OMI was launched in 2017. Um, the key points to take away here are that they are a polar orbiting, which means they have global coverage once per day. So only one snapshot, but everywhere over the globe. Um, and the values that uh, I will be reporting are column contents. This is the amount of NO2 between the surface and approximately 12 kilometers in the altitude, the troposphere. And the units are, for those who are not looking at satellite data every day, the units are a little bit weird. They're uh, in molecules per centimeter squared. These are the column contents. Um, so just, just for your reference, uh, but the, they are in some sense analogous to, to concentrations. And then finally, as Susan alluded to, um, there's only a, a mid-afternoon overpass here. Um, so uh, what is what are the trends of satellite data look like? Um, so I've updated the trends from 2005 to 2019 through December of 2019. And this is from OMI. It's, uh, it's again launched in July 2004. It has annual coverage since 2005, and since 2005, the largest regional decreases are in the United States. Um, there have been moderate decreases in Europe. Um, you can see increases in China between 2005 and 2012, and then a decrease between 2012 and 2019. Um, there are general uh, increases in India, um, with the exception of Delhi itself, um, which I will show in a second. But uh, elsewhere, globally, um, generally, there are um, increasing trends over, especially South, generally over South America, generally increasing and generally increasing over Africa. Um, there's obviously some some exceptions there, um, but yeah, here's here just some city specific uh, examples. So Los Angeles, DC, we've seen decreases in NO2 on the order of 50 to 60 percent over this 15 year period. Santiago, an increase uh, uh, in the opposite direction, 20 to 30 percent. Uh, Paris, moderate decreases, and then Beijing, I like to point out, has the increases from 2000. Five to about 2012, but with a very sharp decrease in 2008. This is not an error with the satellite data. This was actually real reductions to the Beijing Olympics in 2008. So um, OMI can it can capture a lot of these trends. Um, that uh, yeah. So how does TROPOMI look like? Um, here I'm gonna show a snapshot. Here I'm showing a snapshot of the United States. I'll show China and India in the next slide. Um, but it's quite amazing, at least in my opinion. Um, we can see uh, lots of different features here. I tried to summarize as best I could on the right here, and I'll just go down quickly. Clear, very clearly, you can see all the major cities in the United States. Um, but in addition to seeing the major cities, we can start to see individual power plants, especially in the western United States, but also in the um, Ohio River Valley. We can start to see road, individual roadway networks, for example, in Idaho, Montana, even Nebraska, 
um, we can start to see the oil and gas operations. There's been papers on this published already, um, but particularly you can see the Permian, um, Bakken, and also the Uinta Basin in Utah. Um, you can see individual airports. You can't see that in this particular image, but um, some airports very clearly show up. Um, you can see cement kilns. One of the, the smaller dots uh, down there is uh, in Mexico is a cement kiln. And also you can see copper mining operations um, as well as steel mills. So you can start to pinpoint all of these smaller sources where the emissions and the concentrations near these sources are very unknown. Um, and we can start to get that with, with tropomate. Um, so I've actually used uh, the same scale, approximately the same scale for um, China, and you can see very clearly that uh, the NO2 is much larger. Um, this is before the coronavirus uh, outbreak, and so I'm stopping at December 31st, but if you want to take a look at um, how the coronavirus has uh, affected NO2, um, I highly recommend checking out Fei Liu's uh, uh, work. She, it was actually very widely covered this past weekend, perhaps you saw it on the news. But going back to how tropomy can be used for, for both these regions, you can see um, individual power plants again, you can start to see you know, uh, valleys, um, and then you can also compare individual cities to each other. Um, so um, very interesting and um, uh, to see. Uh, one, one point I, I do want to make here is that um, th a lot of the, the NOx is originating from sources other than the large power plants in China. So China generally has all has emission controls in all of their largest power plants. So a lot of the NOx is now coming from other sources, such as transportation, residential, and industrial sources. In India, we're seeing uh, general increases over time, and I can discuss more of that later if there's interest. Um, another cool thing you can do with tropomy, since it has very high spatial resolution, is you can oversample over short periods of time. So here I'm showing just uh, individual days of the week um, over the uh, about one and a half years worth of data here. And um, we can very clearly see a weekday, weekend cycle of air pollution. This is, of course, due to the emissions. Um, people aren't working as much on Saturday and Sunday. Um, and there's a couple of interesting things to take away here. First, um, that there's variability within the cities. So, for example, I like to point out Washington, D.C., if you take a close look here. Um, for example, on Fridays, it's generally lower than the other days of the week versus, say, Los Angeles where we see an increase on Friday compared to other days of the week. So that's interesting, but um, so that was something I didn't expect. Another thing that I just noticed recently is if you look at the uh, Permian Basin in, in, in Texas, there's no cycle whatsoever. It's essentially flat the entire, um, the entire uh, week. So a couple of, there's interesting things still looking at this, but just one thing you can do. Another thing, um, is looking at the seasonal cycles of air pollution. Um, so this actually mostly has to do with the NO2 lifetime and not emissions. And I really wanted to point this out because NO2 concentrations do not always equal NOx emissions. Um, in, many cases, in many cases, NO2 concentrations can be analogous to NOx emissions, but you have to make sure you're comparing similar months or seasons. Um, for, for the northern, just note that uh, Tropomy has difficulty over snow, so there's some issues in the winter in the northern parts, Minnesota, Canada, et cetera. So just wanted to point that out real quick. But any, very clearly, you can see NO2 is larger during the winter time, and that is due to the longer lifetime of, of NO2, even though emissions are likely similar, approximately similar between the two. Um, so this brings me back to what's already been discussed that we're going to um, um, we have NO2 at 100-meter uh, resolution for, 20, uh, for the 2010 to 2012 period, centered on 2011, and we're now um, using OMI to estimate uh, trends from 2005 to present as part of the HACAST, a part of our HACAST project and also with HEI. Um, so that's something that we will hopefully have results soon, and um, so be out on the lookout for that. Um, and I just want to very put it, quickly put a plug in for the other instruments. The future is now. GEMS has already been launched over East Asia. 
Um, it is a satellite instrument that will be taking geostationary measurements of um, pollution over China, India, and South Korea. And um, hopefully we'll be seeing images of that in the next several months, if not a year or so from now. Um, and then there's Tempo, which will be launched in a few years from now. Um, and these are going to be uh, geostationary, and they will have much higher spatial resolution than even Trobo meter. Or not much, but it, they will have higher spatial resolution. Um, and geostationary will be able to observe all hours, all daylit hours of the day, so approximately 7, 8 in the morning to 5, 6 p.m. in the evening versus our 1, uh, 1, 1 p.m. afternoon overpass. Um, that's it for me. I think we can uh, take any questions if there are any.